I remember getting a text from a, a friend who's another classmate from West Point saying, hey man, I'm so sorry to hear about Taylor. I knew you guys were close. I was like, what, what are you talking about? And I saw all over Facebook and in major news sources that like literally my best friend in the world was murdered. So my name is Josh Halu. I was in the US Army as an active duty army officer. I served actively from 2009 to 2016 after going to West Point for four years. So I was actually born in Jerusalem, of all places. I had a, I had a Jewish American mom and a uh, Israeli Arab father, which is very atypical. And they met in Israel when my mom was out there studying at university, moved back to the country when I was two years old. We moved to Denver, Colorado, which is where I grew up. And uh, shortly after that, uh, when I was four years old, my dad actually took his own life and died from suicide. And that was a huge, you know, impactful event that changed the whole trajectory of my life as I knew it. And I kind of consider it a bit of an origin story. So when I was four years old, my, my mom walked into the utility closet early one morning when she didn't see my father in bed next to her and you know, three small children sleeping in the house and found my dad hanging by his neck. And, uh, and that really, that, re that single event changed the whole direction of my life. Shortly after that, my mom was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So mental illness was something I, I faced very regularly throughout, throughout most of my childhood. And you know, I experienced the highs and lows of my mom's you know, reactions and I, I never felt like I had a, a really quality childhood and you know, fought a lot, you know, got in fights in school, got in a lot of trouble. And eventually when I was 14 years old, my mom actually decided to send me away to military school. So I went from uh, Denver, Colorado to a boarding school in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, it was called the New Mexico Military Institute. So about halfway through my freshman year of high school, I went from just being a regular civilian kid to all of a sudden, you know, one day to the next, I was living in barracks and getting my head shaved and, and I was getting yelled at and learning how to march and salute and shine my shoes and, you know, everything that goes with the military environment, learning to do push-ups and, you know, just, <laughs> just learning how to do PT and, and, and adjusting to the discipline of a military environment. And that was, that was I think, incredibly traumatic for me. But, but pretty rapidly, I, I, I found that, you know, I was, I was very, I had a lot of ADHD growing up and had a hard time focusing. And I found that once I adjusted to that military environment and, you know, I found my, like Jocko Willick says, like discipline equals freedom. And I found my freedom through the discipline of the environment. And um, because I couldn't rely on my parents, you know, I, I never felt like I could rely on my parents and they'd already sent me away. I decided when it really clicked when I was in high school that I wanted to make the, the military a career and decided in, when I was a sophomore to, uh, to really focus my efforts throughout the rest of high school on, on getting into West Point and making West Point the college that I would attend and then from there going to become a military officer. The high school that I was going to at the time had a, had a commissioning program. So it was a four year high school with a two year junior college. And so most of the classmates that I had that were you know, thinking about the military, because it was a military high school and junior college, um, were all thinking about the officer route. So it was just, it was just for me kind of the, the obvious route that I was going to go because I knew I wanted to go to college. You know, I knew I wanted to get a degree and, and typically if you get a degree, you know, if you do ROTC, you go to West Point, whatever, um, you go and become a commissioned officer. So it was just everybody around me was geared that way. But actually when I was 15 years old, um, and I'd just come back from my, my first summer home in Denver after my, my first semester at military school. And I went home and I was, I was convinced that my parents would let me stay and not send me back to military school. Like I was begging them. And they made it abundantly clear that I wasn't welcome back home, that I was going back to, and I almost got kicked out of school that first semester because I was getting in a ton of fights. I was getting D's and F's. I was just not in a good place. And I was hoping actually that I could get kicked out of school. And when I got back home that summer, my parents made it very clear that I wasn't welcome back home. And if I got kicked out of school, I wasn't moving back into home with them. So I showed back up that, that sophomore year of high school and on the very first day of high school, I was in a junior ROTC class that was mandatory for all of the cadets. And there was an officer 
um, from school that came into our classroom and he asked the class if anybody was inter interested in attending a service academy. So, you know, West Point, Na Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, Merchant Marine, Coast Guard. And honestly, I didn't know anything about the service academies, nothing at all. But I had a bunch of friends that were interested and stood up. And so I was like, well, I'd rather, I'd rather get up and leave this classroom than sit in this, you know, in this, in this boring classroom on the first day. And I still, I still hadn't adjusted to the military life. And I, and I went out to um, this officer's office and th this guy, his name was Major Rocky Johnson, and he was the liaison between um, West Point and the other service academies and our high school and junior college because West Point and the other service academies actually send um, applicants to the academies to my school for like a prep year if you don't get uh, admitted in your first time uh, like applying to West Point. So they'll send you back to my school um, to do one year in junior college, like in improve your grades or improve your physical performance or something, reapply and then go back. So we have a big program with my high school with the service academies. So I walked into this guy's office and he said, all right, if you guys are interested in going to service academy, like it started last year, but it starts now. Let's look at your grades. Let's look at your extracurricular activities, your sports letters, like every, your, 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 your clubs that you're participating in, like your cadet leadership, all of that stuff. And he took a look at my grades and I, I think I had like a 1.8 and he was like, Dude, you're not get you're not getting into West Point. <laughs> no, I was 15. I still have three years left of high school, and and to hear that, I was like, oh, you're gonna tell me I man, I, like I jeopardized like the future that you know that I could have. I didn't even know I wanted to go to West Point at that point in time, but it was like somebody telling you you can't do something, telling me I can't do something, like so early on in my high school, like it, something clicked in my head, and literally from one day to the next, the rest of high school, I got nearly straight A's. You know, I lettered in three sports. I I became you know, the highest ranking um, cadet that, that you could be as a, as a high school student. I became a cadet first sergeant. Uh, you know, I, I participated in a bunch of clubs and, and activities and really geared my entire, like the rest of my high school existence to this singular goal of going to West Point as, as the opportunity for me to really take ownership of my life and take the course of my life into my own hands. I gave up a lot of freedom when you joined the military but I also felt like that was an exchange I was willing to make to go to one of the most prestigious universities in the world and, and have that as my route to become an army officer. So I was 17 when I graduated high school. And, and because I was 17, I actually even had to have my parents sign off you know, on, on the waiver because I wasn't 18 yet to make that decision. And I went back home for like four or six weeks after my graduation from high school. I just spent that time working out and, you know, I was working, I remember working at Albertsons at the time too. Like I was pushing carts and bagging groceries just to save a little bit of money. And uh, I showed up on, on day one of cadet basic training and it was like game on, man. Like here I am, I'm, I'm in the big leagues, like I've made it, right? Like, going you know through life as you go through like the ranks or school or whatever you're used to you know you go you're at the top of your game say as a as a high school student and now you're all the way back at the bottom of the barrel as a as a new cadet at basic training at West Point and for me it wasn't it wasn't a huge shock you know I had plenty of classmates who didn't come from military high schools obviously like right? this this was their first exposure to a military environment so I really excelled at the, you know, throughout all of West Point, but certainly at basic training because I already knew how to march and salute, and then I knew the rank structure, and I knew how to shine my shoes and keep my room tidy, and you know, make a bed with a 45 degree angle, like all of those things, like that. That's bread and butter to me, and I've been doing that for three and a half years. So I really had the opportunity to um, to shine, I think, early on and feel comfortable and and feel like even though I was now in the big leagues, like going to West Point is a big deal. I felt very comfortable in that environment and I knew I had made the right decision. And honestly, I, I couldn't believe that I had gotten in, that I was, I was there. It was, it, was like, it was like really receiving that on the very first day while getting yelled at by upperclassmen. I'm like, man, I, I'm already in the door, man. That's, that's amazing. As a freshman, um, we were, we're, we're called plebes and we're responsible for doing all of the, like these additional duties. You know, every, every morning, I would have to either go collect the trash from the upperclassmen's doors or, you know, I have to deliver laundry, you know, and hang up everybody's uniforms in their closets and, and you know, do all these different, um, like sit at the table and you have to, I have to pour 
you know, drinks and cut, like serve upperclassmen their food every Christmas. Uh, the, the plebes, uh, you sit at tables of 10 in, in this enormous dining hall that fits all 4,000 cadets in, into it at once. So we all march to the chow hall, you know, you take seats, you get served, you know, at your table in, in um, family style with tables of 10, you know, that's made up of, of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And, and as a freshman, you have all your responsibilities, but on Christmas, there's always a really fun uh, experience where the, the plebes are responsible for buying cigars for the whole table. And, um, and we have a Christmas dinner. It's usually like maybe steak and lobster. And at the end of the dinner, everybody stands up on top of the table and we start singing the 12 nights of Christmas as loud as we can. And people are like throwing dinner rolls all over the dining hall. And, and then we all go outside um, on the parade field area and everybody smokes these cigars that you know the plebes were responsible for buying. So that's how you kind of like show up and, and do a good job as a plebe is getting good cigars for the table. And nobody knows how to smoke cigars. You know, we're like 17, 18 year old kids. And so people are just like puking on the plane, you know? So I, I remember that very, very vividly. That was a fun experience as a, as a freshman is really like getting into the, the pomp and circumstance, the, tra the tradition of these old school military universities and the military. But my other favorite memory is as a, as a senior, when we choose our branch of service, and I became an army aviator. So over the course of four years at West Point, uh, you're constantly evaluated. You know, I'm evaluated on my military performance, my leadership performance, my physical fitness, and my academics. And those um, all combine in a, in a weighted format to put you in an order of merit list. So you have a class rank. And then when you get to your, fr your senior year, the army releases the number of slots for each branch in the army for your class. So if you have a class of a thousand people, there's a thousand slots and it could be, all right, this year we've got 80 slots for infantry and we've got a hundred slots for aviation and 20 slots for chemical corps. And you pretty much go straight down the order of merit list by class rank and select what you want, you know, as your branch of service orders one through 16 at the time. And I wanted to be an, an aviation officer. I wanted to fly helicopters. I, th I thought that was a pretty cool way to, to experience the military. And I was graduating near the top of my class um, fortunately, so I had any choice that I wanted. So when we actually find out what our branch of service is going to be, it's a, it's a big production. You know, as all of the thousand seniors, we march to a big auditorium hall and they give us all these envelopes. And in the envelope has our branch insignia. And, you know, everybody's trying to feel it because they have you open it up at the same time. And, you know, you, you pour the insignia into your arm and you either celebrate or you <laughs> cry, you know, maybe it's what you wanted, what you didn't want. Um, and everybody's trying to feel it to be like, oh, is that wings? Is that, what is it, what's in here, you know? And, um, and I remember watching and I had complete and utter confidence that I was gonna get aviation because, you know, I was at the top of my class. I knew that once I poured my insignia into my hand and I saw that I was aviation, you know, I was, I was incredibly excited. And I knew that I'd gotten exactly what I wanted. Um, and I remember looking around all my other friends, you know, some people were very disappointed. Some people were celebrating and high-fiving. And, and from there, I went to a, it was like a, 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 an all aviation, branch um, party. So it was like, I don't know, Yingling had donated a bunch of kegs. So we had a bunch of kegs we were draining in this big auditorium. Uh, a bunch of us brought cigars. So we're sitting there, you know, I was, I think it was, I was, I was maybe 21 at the time and we're smoking cigars, just getting wasted. And all of the, all of the officers at West Point who are aviation officers were there celebrating with us. And I remember <laughs> my friends and I, and everybody else around, we took the pins off the backs of our aviation wings and and took turns just punching the, you know, they were, we called them blood bars, but punching the, the insignia into our chest is kind of a, you know, a rite of passage. So I remember standing up and, and I, have a, I remember I have a picture of me with a, with a cigar like hanging from my lip, <laughs> just probably drunk eyes, you know, drunk as can be. And my friend just punching me as hard as he could in, in my chest and just pushing those pins in, into my, you know, deep into my chest and, you know, feeling the pain and seeing the blood run down my shirt and feeling just incredible pride that like this is, you know, this is this is where I'd gotten to on my journey after such a challenging childhood and a you know challenging challenging journey through high school to get to West Point to begin with to now like really seeing where my journey was going to take me beyond that you know with my pins in my chest and and then and then the rest of uh, the rest of your senior year instead of wearing you know your uh, your your West Point crest you wear your branch insignia so. You know, I had a lot of pride walking around knowing I was going to be 
an aviator in the Army for the next seven, seven years because uh, if you choose to go aviation at West Point, uh, instead of just having a five-year commitment, I had to do um, five years after flight school, and flight school is typically about two years. So it was a seven-year commitment. And, um, and that actually, I was, I was engaged to my wife at the time, and interestingly, she, that became a very, a very challenging subject between us because I kind of chose to go aviation unilaterally. You know, when, we get, when you get married, when you get married, you, you, you typically should make decisions as a couple. But in my mind, I really wanted to, I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do because I had earned it. And I remember briefly, my, my ex-wife gave me, when she found out I went aviation, she gave me the engagement ring back. And she was like, you know, I had signed up for five years, not seven. <laughs> and I was like, man, you know, at, at, at 20, 21 years old, like, these are big decisions, right? Like, these are big decisions that you're making for the next five or seven years. And they impact, they impact you know, much more beyond yourself. But in my mind, I was like, I want to spend my time in the Army flying helicopters. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I graduated West Point May 23rd of 2009. I was 21 years old, and uh, you know, graduation is you know everything I hoped it would be. We had our class rings, you know. I, I think the chief of staff of the army was our graduation speaker. I was, you always hope it's going to be the president because the president rotates every year between you know the, the different service academies. And but I think I think uh, Bush had spoken the year before, so I knew we were going to get the president. But you know we had a really great speaker. Um, who was the chief of staff of the army, and that was exciting. And then, you know, standing up and tossing your hat in the air is like, it was one of the uh, just most gratifying feelings ever. And then right after you graduate, you know, we, we go to a predetermined location, change out of our cadet uniform, put on our army officer uniform, you know, swearing with our o oath of office. And I remember, um, you know, getting my family pinning on my, my second lieutenant bars on my shoulders. And it's like, wow, I'm... Like I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an officer now, I'm like no longer a cadet. I've been a cadet for seven and a half years. I was an officer now. People started saluting me you know, on my walk to the car. It's like crazy, I'm crazy, you know? Like, man, I've, I've, I've arrived back at the bottom, <laughs> back at the bottom of the barrel. And, um, and I drove from New York, where West Point is, to New Jersey um, because I was engaged. So I graduated May 23rd. I got married on May 25th when I was 21 years old. You know, all my family and friends were we're at West Point for graduation, so we all just migrated, you know, right over to New Jersey, where my wife's family was from. And, you know, May 24th was was my rehearsal dinner. May 25th, I got married. May 26th, I went on my honeymoon and came back a week later, packed up my car, drove south to Alabama, Fort Rucker, Alabama, where the uh, Army Flight School is. Flight school was was a really it was it was challenging. It was exciting. You know, I had to learn so much before even before even setting foot into a helicopter for the first time, I had to pass several courses that were required. So the first one was dunker training, where I had to go into, it's, it's learning how to evacuate your aircraft if you end up you know, hitting the water, because a helicopter will just flip over and just start sinking to the bottom of the ocean like that. And when you are upside down, it's very difficult to orient yourself to like where the doors are and. So, you know, you're taught to follow, you know, look at the bubbles, follow your bubbles, you know, be able to navigate with your hands to open the door and how to pop, pop the emergency hatch and things like that. So, you know, that, that is actually pretty terrifying. But very quickly, you know, I learned, I learned that this is, you know, it's not, we're not, we're not playing, playing war, you know, we're not playing army, like we're training for the job that I'm going to do. And that job is life and death. And I better be, you know, so I really paid attention. Like if, if I go down in water, I want to know how to get out of that helicopter and survive. Um, you know, and from there I went to the Army SEER school, which is uh, S-E-R-E. It stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. It's another mandatory course that you have to pass before starting flight school. And it's a very, very intensive um, course for three weeks where I went through um, learning how to survive uh, the, 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 the nature of the course is to teach you as a pilot, um, and special operators also go through the course, but if you're a pilot and you get shot down behind enemy lines, it's how are you going to survive? You know, sh should, should you survive the crash, right? How are you going to survive to get picked up and brought back, you know, brought back to safety? So, you know, first you learn how to 
I learned how to survive off the land, right? How to, how to set traps and kill game and, you know, identify what berries I could eat and, and start fires and start fires, you know, in holes so that the enemy can't see smoke, like all these kinds of things. And then evasion, right? Like how to evade the enemy once they're on your tracks, how to avoid capture. Um, and then resistance. Resistance is, you know, truly getting captured in a, in, you know, by the enemy and being put into a POW camp, which is, even though it's in training, it's incredibly real that, that you know, I, I lost track of that I, that I wasn't in training anymore. It's, it's so intense, like being interrogated, being tortured um, for days on end, like being starved, being beaten. And it, like really, really, re they would show us videos of like, you know, afterwards or leading into the really intensive training of like John McCain, you know, who survived seven years in a POW camp. And you're like, holy shit, like how? How? Because a week in a POW camp, you know, like in a simulated POW camp, like, it, I mean, it, it, it made me lose, lose sight of, of like being a human. You have to really remind yourself. And then escape is the last, is the last E. So it's, you know, how to communicate non-verbally between, you know, you and your cellmates and start, start planning how to escape, you know, the POW camp. And, and the whole goal of Sears School, the, the motto is return with honor. So it's, it's not just about, you know, returning, getting back home, you know, getting back to your country, your unit, whatever. It's about returning with honor. So, you know, not, not giving information up when you're getting interrogated, like, you know, really, really being, being careful about how you're representing yourself and representing your country. You know, it doesn't matter what the enemy thinks. It's we still have morals and ethics, you know, as Americans that, that we want to uphold and, 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 you know, re return with honor, right? very serious. So once, once I pass that, not, not everybody does pass that. I remember some people had extreme claustrophobia and, um, and you find yourself in very, very small cages at Sears school sometimes uh, for extended periods of time. And, you know, it really, it really can make some people go crazy. And I remember some, there's a safe word, you know, there's a safe word at flight school, which is kind of like, if, if I say the safe word, it's over for me, you know, I'm getting pulled out of here. Um, and so I remember hearing somebody say the safe word, they got removed from training and they get rebranched to whatever the, the needs of the army are and, and they're packing their house up and they're no longer gonna be an aviator. You know, it's, it's, that, it's that serious, it's that quick. Um, fortunately, that wasn't a, an issue that I had. It was a very challenging school. And I, and I, I remember feeling like, like truly a lot of trauma, you know, coming back from that experience and just like sleeping in my bed again at night, not having nightmares. Like the nightmares really haunt, haunted me for quite, quite some time. And sometimes, you know, I'd go, shopping in town this is crazy it's it's people's job this is crazy it's people's job to work at sears school as interrogators you know and <laughs> as like the prison guards and i remember like walking down the aisle at uh, like piggly wiggly or something in alabama and like turning the aisle in the milk aisle and seeing one of my interrogators who you know who who uh, he wasn't friendly he, he wasn't a friendly interrogator and like it like stopped me cold. And I literally, like I had to walk to another aisle and like catch my breath and be like, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not in that environment. It's not, you know, it was just training. Like I had to, I had to remind myself of that. It's, it's, it's that intense. And then getting through, and once, once I got through that, then, then I started ground school for flight school. Ground school, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole new language that, 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 that I, I was learning. So there's, aerodynamics. You have to understand how the whole aircraft is working. Like, why does this propeller keep you up? And how does, you know, how does aerodynamically it create lift? And, you know, learn all the systems, all the engine components. You know, that was another, another major component. Learn how um, weather impacts the way that a helicopter operates. Like all these different, um, like ground schools, even like how to identify enemy aircraft, you know, when they're by, by their silhouette. So you can identify if there's any enemy in the area. So that was just a, you know, maybe a few weeks. And from that point, we went to simulators and, you know, I got into these really cool simulators that were like on big stilts and full motion simulators of millions of dollars and, you know, start learning the emergency procedures. So if, you know, you lose an engine, what you're going to do and start to learn what the feel of a helicopter is, because it's, you know, just, just getting to hover takes some time. It's four different controls. One control does one thing. The other control does the other. Your two feet do different things. And you know, learning what we call control touch. It's like, it gets to be like riding a bike, but it, you know, it's like you're teaching yourself new, new motor skills that have to be solidified in your, in your brain. So, you know, once, once I got through the simulators, then I remember meeting my first instructor pilot and going out for 
my first helicopter ride. And for whatever reason, we, they call this the nickel ride. And um, it goes back in history, I don't know why, but you show up with a nickel and you give that nickel to your instructor pilot and it's like, and he, you know, he collects these nickels is like, no, these are all the, the first time he, he's taking a pilot up for their very first flight. And I remember picking up, you know, and, and taking off and, and he gave me the controls and feeling the helicopter in my hands for the very first time and like, you know, wiggling the collective, which increases the pitch of the rotor blades, which creates more lift and like feeling the helicopter up and down and recognizing like, wow, like I'm flying. Like how, how, how <laughs> like how insane to be like, you know, just f flying through the air three dimensionally. Like I didn't know how to hover at that point. So it was like kind of rocky, but you know, when you're, when you're there, you're like, wow, I'm like literally I'm moving. I'm, I'm like manipulating this whole freaking machine around me and I can like go up, down, left, right, wherever I want to go. And it was, it was incredible. It was an incredible feeling. The first part of flight school is all in a training helicopter. It's, it's a civilian helicopter called a Bell Jet Ranger, just a single engine aircraft. And everybody trains on that. I think it's like the first eight weeks. And, and everybody's just, just learning how to fly at that point. You're learning how to pre-flight an aircraft, how to you know, turn on an aircraft, use your checklist. You know, everything's kind of by the book and getting the, the feel for how, how the helicopter works. And after, and, and it was actually pretty fun because, you know, this was around Alabama. We would even, you'd, we'd fly from one, you know, base to another base um, and we'd shut down. And it, it was really cool, like experiencing being a pilot where you just fly into another, like a civilian, you know, a civilian landing pad and you shut down and we'd just go like, you know, eat lunch in, an, in another city and then pick up and fly back. And like experiencing the freedom that comes with, you know, aerial flight is, is pretty phenomenal. And after graduating, after finishing that part of the program, we then learned instruments. So, you know, the first part of the program, you're learning how to fly, vi fly visually. The second part is flying instruments. And instruments is take away all of the visuals and you're committed to just looking at the dash in the helicopter and flying that way. Like you're not allowed to look up. We actually had to put these screens around our helmets that prevented us from seeing outside the window. So imagine how, how crazy it is, like you really feel like this, spatial disorientation you know, like your body wants to you know you might feel something in your body and the helicopter is doing one thing like it looks like according to the instruments maybe you're like straight and level but for some reason because of the way the wind's hitting it feels like you're like leaning this way and your body just really wants to correct it and you're you're kind of fighting against that urge because you feel it in your body and you know your your balance system may may not be on and you have to you have to, i had to really be committed to the instruments because it's very easy you know if if helicopters are not a very stable platform like a plane, you know, which is just flying through the air and creating lift under its wings. So if a helicopter pilot enters clouds, you know, accidentally, like not accidentally, but like if a storm comes in that wasn't forecast and now all of a sudden you're in clouds, you immediately have to commit to the instruments because it's so easy. What it's, it's happened, you know, it's happened many times where you just flip the helicopter over because you think you're, you're turning it straight and level and all of a sudden you're just, you're just rolling into the ground. There was an incident that was ha like some malfunction on the aircrafts where they call it the unplanned or something like cyclic, cyclic maneuver. So the cyclic is what controls the pitch of the helicopter. And, and it became an emergency procedure because for some reason, it's sometimes the cyclic would like just would, would fly to the left and it would roll the helicopter and you had to like fight it back. But I, and that never happened to me. Um, but that became an emergency procedure because it did happen and people were killed that way in training because of some, some malfunction in the aircraft. Um, but fortunately, fortunately, I never experienced that, but it did impact one thing at flight school un that was unfortunate, um, which is uh, a big part of flight school it used to be where you would take your um, solo flight. So after you finished that first part of flight school, you got to you know, take off from a landing strip, do a, do a traffic pattern and come and land. And you got to do that by yourself in the helicopter without an instructor pilot. So because, of, because that emergency procedure requires both pilots to be on the controls and kind of really wrench the, wrench the cyclic back into posi position, um, they removed the ability for us to have that first solo flight. So I never had a, never had a solo flight. But I also, you know, I also am still alive. So that's also, <laughs> that's good. So after that, um, then we went into OH-58 helicopters. Um, and that was the next phase of training. And that was getting into tactical training. So from that, we started learning how to navigate with a map, you know, flying over the, the contours of, of the earth and, and recognizing how to, how to navigate, you know, and pick out terrain features because 
you know, you do land navigation in the military and you're on the ground, it's very different than how you notice things from the air, like what's a good reference point, you know, like, like cemeteries become very good reference points. You wouldn't think of that when you're on the ground, but it's very easy to see a cemetery, you know, from the sky and also find it on the map and know where you are. So things like that, you know, from, from the aerial view start to be different. And we start to learn how to do more, you know, tactical, like fly in formation, you know, fly tactically, um, things like that. And then after finishing that, that's, that's the whole like basic part of flight school. Then as a class, we show up in a classroom and just like at West Point, we have an order of merit list and you wa walked into a classroom and maybe, you know, if there were 30 people in my flight school, there were at the time there were four aircraft in the army, the, you know, CH-47 Chinook, the UH-60 Blackhawk, OH-58 Kiowa Warrior and AH-64 Apache attack helicopter. And it'd be, you know, if there were 30 of us in the class, there were 30 tick marks literally on a whiteboard, which was like how many of each of those aircrafts and straight, you know, the, the person at the top of the class would get up literally with your finger and wipe off the tick mark, you know, next to the aircraft that, and that was your choice. That was your aircraft that you were going to go, go fly. You know, so if you really wanted to be an Apache pilot, like usually there aren't that many slots for an Apache helicopter and those go first. Um, so, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd be like, all right, I'm number 16 and number 13 just took the second to last spot in the Apache pilot. Like who, who are the two guys in front of me? You guys better not pick that last one, but you know, you get, you get what you get. And then uh, a few weeks after that, you show up and you start training in that, what we call the advanced airframe, which is gonna be the helicopter that you fly in the army. So I, I chose Blackhawks. So Apaches are typically go out first um, for, I, I mean, I, I can theorize, I think, um, because it's something that I've thought about actually a lot in the last few years as I've, as I've you know, healed from a lot of PTSD and trauma. And, you know, I chose Blackhawks. Actually, I, I was like middle of my class at flight school, so Blackhawks were the only option for me. And I was fine with that because that was the helicopter I was going to choose anyway. But Apaches usually go first, I think, because they're one of the, they're like the sexy helicopter, right? They're the ones with guns. They're the ones that you have the, you know, you're, you're both the pilot and the gunner. It's just the two of you. There's no other crew. They look super sexy. And, you know, to say you're an attack helicopter pilot is, is kind of a cool thing. And for me, though, I always found it, I mean, I'm just thinking about this after the fact, but I, I found it to be a little bit troubling. I could never internalize the idea of myself flying an attack helicopter because the job necessarily is putting targets, you know, in your, in, you know, pu pu putting either bodies or, you know, enemy or whatever in your, in your target and pulling the trigger. And I think in, in, in my opinion, I think that there's, there's the excitement about flying something sexy and having this, you know, super, super cool helicopter, the one that you're flying. And it's kind of removed from the reality of like, do you know what it's going to be like to sit in that helicopter, like look at human bodies and be prepared to pull the trigger and end lives? You know, enemy or not, you got to live with that. And that's it's something that I, I never gravitated toward an, an attack helicopter. It wasn't even an option for me because of where I was in my in my class rank. But I'm I'm almost glad that that decision was removed from me because I, I could have been swayed to be like, OK, I'm at the top of the class you know, attack helicopters go out first. That's what I should do because it's, it's what the top of the class goes and does. Um, but, but yeah, I've kind of wrestled with that to that decision about, you know, like, like, like what, what my role in warfare is and what I want to live with for the rest of my life. After graduating from flight school, I'm a, you know, full, full fledged pilot. And I went from there to ranger school actually, which is very atypical. Um, for a pilot to do. Um, I was kind of, I was never torn between infantry and aviation. I was always kind of convinced I want to go aviation, but some of my, the, the officers I respected the most, some of my best mentors at West Point were infantry officers. And, you know, each infantry officer, if, if they're getting promoted, they have a ranger tab on their shoulder. And, you know, in the army, we, we just like in, you know, in the, in the Navy, you see a, you see a trident, right? And you're like, uh, the Navy SEAL, like that, that represents something elite. And it's the same thing as a, you know, having the Army Ranger tab. Um, but more than that, it's going through this school that is going to test you, you know, tested me so much that you know, really figuring out what my resolve was and how I could perform under pressure. Um, so I remember being a senior at West Point and one of, like, my, one of my favorite mentors is this officer named Major Mayo. He's probably a colonel or a general at this point in time. 
um, you know, he came up and talked to me while we were doing drill and parade and, you know, we were just kind of standing around for a bit and he was like, do you know what, what branch you're going to go do? And I said, I'm going to go aviation. And he was, and he was an infantry officer. He said, uh, Josh, you know, if, uh, you'd be a great infantry officer, but you know, if aviation is what you want to do, man, you're going to do a great job of that too. But I encourage you, if you ever get the opportunity, go to ranger school. He's like, it's the best leadership school, like best leadership course in the entire military. You'll learn so much about yourself. It's going to be the hardest thing you ever do in your life, but you're going to come out so much stronger from it. And so that stuck in my head. And over the course of flight school, I kind of started to feel soft a little bit, like, uh, you know, like make fun of pilots because we need our crew rest and, you know, we have good accommodations and all that kind of stuff. And, and I had this feeling in my, in my, in my heart that I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to suffer a little bit, you know, I wanted to get back into the field before I reported to my duty station and really experience, you know, what, what, it, what it felt like to be, say, an infantry soldier who was going to be in the back of my helicopter, you know, really relate to re the, the mission of those soldiers that I was going to be flying around so I could take my job that much more seriously. And I applied to go to ranger school. It was an incredibly arduous process. I had to do a lot of, you know, like not just the application, not just the interviews, but all the, you know, the PT, the ruck marches, the land navigation, pass all these different, you know, benchmarks. And I remember I got to the very last approval level and I went to see the chief of staff of the aviation, of aviation who was at Fort Rucker at the end of flight school. And I just needed his signature to get approved to go to flight school. And I walk in there and he asked me, he didn't have a ranger tab. He asked me why I wanted to go to ranger school. And I was like, well, I want to, you know, I think it's going to, it's going to, it's going to make me a better leader. It's going to improve my, you know, credibility with my soldiers, make me more able to relate to the soldiers in the back of my aircraft. Like all these, you know, all these answers that I had prepared, but that were actually real to me. And I remember this guy just, just went off on me, you know, like, like an old school ass chewing session, like, who do you think you are, Lieutenant? You wanna, you wanna be a better leader? Why don't you just not waste your fucking time at, flight, at ranger school and show up at your duty station and get your platoon and start leading? You know, like that kind of thing. Like, like why, why would we send you to ranger school? Waste all this, you know, waste all the money. You get, go get injured at ranger school. That we, you know, we spent all this money on you becoming a pilot. Like, show up at your duty station. So I remember he just went off on me and then kicked me out of his office. And I was like, I just do all this damn work. And, and this guy with an ego trip is, is gonna end, <laughs> end this for me. And I remember... I, like I walked out and I saw his secretary, you know, outside and she just like, she just like gave me this like sad eyes, like, you know, like recognizing that her boss was an asshole. <laughs> you know, she probably heard this kind of stuff a lot. And I remember calling her like two weeks later, just convinced that I wasn't going to ranger school. And I was like, hey, did he ever sign my paperwork? And she's like, yeah, yeah, he did. You can, you can come pick it up. <laughs> it's like, all right. So I picked it up. I went to uh, pre-ranger school on the way to Fort Campbell. That was my first duty assignment, 101st Airborne Division. I remember going to pre-ranger school. It was, the, it was so freaking hard and I knew nothing about infantry tactics, but I passed, I failed all the infantry stuff, but I passed land navigation, the PT test, the ruck march, like the things that you had to pass. And I, and I had no confidence going to ranger school. I, had, I thought I made a huge mistake, like truly. And you know, that idea of like return with honor, you know, like the idea of not, of not accomplishing something that I, I set out to do or failing, you know, it was, it was, it, it gave me so much fear, like so much, it, I, you know, I was, I was, I was full of fear that I, that I had signed up for something that I wasn't capable of actually doing, of completing and it, like failing something for the first time in my life and, and, you know, losing respect for myself. And I remember showing up to, to ranger school on that first day and they marched us over from pre-ranger school at Fort Benning to ranger school. And we're like, you know, then we, Maybe there were 50 of us at pre-ranger school. There's like 500 people starting ranger school on the first day. And I march into the formation. They start calling our names and, and you know, to, to get us into formation, like all 500 people by roster number. And everybody's in formation. And I'm the very last person standing there. And the ranger instructor comes up and he looks at his roster. He's like, what's your name? Uh, you know, I'm Holly, whatever. And he's like, you're not on here. Sorry, man. You got to go home. And I was like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, I got all the way here now. And, and honestly, I thought it was like, it was, it was almost a relief at first. Cause I was like, okay, well, that's a good reason for me not to have, you know, to come back from ranger school. At least it's not like, oh, I didn't make it or, or I got injured or something like that. Like maybe I have an excuse now. And as soon as that ranger instructor turned and walked away, my pre-ranger instructor comes up to me and he goes, see these 500 people over here? It's like, 
half of them are going to be gone by the morning after the PT test. Grab your shit and run to the back of the formation. And I was like, seriously? He's like, he's like, fucking do it. I grabbed my, my ruck. I ran to the back of the formation. <laughs> I found a bunk, you know, <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know how, but I like literally snuck into ranger school and sure, sure thing. Like <laughs> the first morning we did the PT test and you know, like 200 people failed because they're so strict and they're trying to weed people out, you know, at the very beginning. And then, you know, it's a continuous process of weeding people out, weeding people out, weeding people out. So, you know, only the best of the best finish. And, um, yeah, somehow 63 days later, I was standing in graduation, getting my ranger tab pin pinned on my shoulder, like barely making it every step of the way. But, you know, like, like the peer evaluations, the, you know, not eating for days, not sleeping at all. You know, it was, the, it was literally, you know, losing 30 pounds, like pushed me to where I felt like I was nothing but just like bone and muscle fiber and grit. And I, I had a, my hat, you know, my, my army hat on my head and I had written in it one more step. Cause like all I could tell myself was all I got to do is just keep taking one more step forward. Like through all of this stress, through all of this intensity, this literally the hardest experience of my life, every single moment for 63 days and like standing there, getting my ranger tab on my shoulder was like, th that was probably the, the best, like the, the best feeling like emotional experience I've ever had. The relief that came with that and the pride, like the, the pride of putting a ranger tab on your shoulder is like, wow. Like I, re I represent something that means something. You know, there's been so many circumstances like that throughout my life and my military career where it's like, you know, so something shouldn't have happened, but some, some interjection or, you know, some guardian angel like gave me the, the nudge in the direction that I needed to go. It even happened the last phase of ranger school when I was in Florida phase, swamp phase. It's the last three weeks and it's so intense in um, like in, in Destin, Florida, literally like wading through swamps, you know, with with your rifle over your head where you got mud up to your shoulders, you know, and, and you're you're two months, almost two months into range school at this point. So, I mean, and you're, you're just fatigued beyond belief and you're on Zodiac boats doing night raids, you know, against enemy forces, like all of that intense military training. And I remember I, I had passed my very last um, leadership uh, role in that phase. So once once you pass your your leadership, you know your your it's called your patrol, your leadership patrol, where you're put into a leadership role and you have to take your unit, you know, accomplish a mission or whatever. Um, you get kind of put into a support role. So now you're carrying the radios, you're carrying the machine gun, you know, you're doing the things to support the people that still need to get their go. And I remember I was so exhausted, and I was I was the radio operator, and. Um, it was like one of the very last missions, like two days before graduation and we were lined up and, you know, it was before sunset and we were literally here for two hours, just waiting for a certain time when, you know, when the, when the raid against the enemy was going to start and we were going to, you know, ambush the enemy. And I fell asleep so hard and you're not supposed to fall asleep, obviously at ranger school. In fact, like you get so tired at ranger school. One of the techniques that we use to stay awake is in our MREs, if, I don't know if, if you remember, but in our MREs, we had these little Tabasco, Tabasco um, hot sauce bottles, like these little tiny Tabasco bottles. And we would literally like put drops of it in our eyes just to keep ourselves alert because like the pain was so much that at least, you know, you weren't falling asleep, but sometimes you could even fall asleep through that. It was crazy. Never been so fatigued in my life, but I fell asleep so hard. And I remember I had this vivid dream of a firefight and I heard all the noise and everything else. And then all of a sudden I hear, RTO, RTO, which is a radio transmitter operator, like, which is my job. And I was like, I snap up and I look up and there's nobody around me. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm fucked. And I get up and I just start sprinting like through the forest, you know, to wherever the sound was coming from. And I break out of the, I break out of the trees and the entire Ranger platoon is in formation. And they're looking for me because they had gone through counts and they, like every squad was reporting that they were fully up. And they're like, but we're, you know, we're supposed to have 31 and we only have 30, but every squad leader, you know, has everybody they're supposed to have. Well, it's because, you know, that like you forget to notice that the radio operator is up there with the platoon leader, you know, is not getting counted by anybody else. And so finally they figured out it was me. And I ran over and this ranger instructor called me to the back and he goes, that's a major safety violation, ranger. Like, you know what that means, right? And I was like, Rogers, Rogers, sorry. You know, I, I knew that meant I was gonna get dropped from the course. I was like, fuck, I made it this far, made it this far, and I fell asleep, you know, like, talk about beating yourself up, you know, like, that was, that was as low as I could possibly have felt. So I get up the next morning, and they're, 
ranger instructors are giving their evaluations to all of the leaders from the previous day. And this ranger instructor calls me over. And very interestingly, this ranger instructor I had met uh, about a year and a half earlier. He had gone through SEER school with me. And I remember being in POW camps with this guy, you know, and like going through some heavy, heavy shit with him. And I remember I showed up to Florida phase for ranger school and I saw him and I was like, hey, ranger sergeant, did we go to, do we go to SEER school together? And he was like, shut the fuck up, ranger. You don't know me. Get back in formation, you know, kind of thing. And I was like, Roger. But he was the guy that caught me sleeping. And he pulls me to the back and he says, I could drop you from the course. You know that. And I was like, right. He's like, he's like, you've got two days until graduation. Keep your shit together. Get back in formation. You couldn't communicate. We only wrote letters. So I couldn't even tell my family, you know, my wife, anybody else, like, don't come to graduation, you know, like people that happen to people because they, you, they, families just show up to graduation hoping they're going to see their graduate and they're not there. I remember like seeing a wife with her kids like showing up and I knew that that guy didn't make it. And I walked over and told her that he didn't make it and just seeing the look on her face, man. So I showed up at, uh, at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, um, the 101st Combat Aviation Brigade. And I, my unit was just coming back from deployment. So they were getting back from you know, taking leave after getting back uh, and just starting to build up again. So I, I showed up and I, um, because I had a Ranger tab on my shoulder, they gave me the first, uh, first platoon leader role that came available, which was a maintenance platoon in the aviation battalion. So I was responsible for all of the mechanics who took care of the um, Blackhawks and, and, um, and Chinook helicopters. So all of a sudden I showed up, you know, I had 130 <laughs> soldiers reporting to me, like my very first job in the army. And I remember one thing they tell you at West Point is, is trust your NCOs, you know, trust your non-commissioned officers, like the, the sergeants. And I had this really great um, Sergeant First Class E7 who was my platoon sergeant. He'd, already, he'd been deployed four times already. You know, I, I didn't have a combat patch. And he was like, I got you, sir. Like, just, you know, like, <laughs> we're in this together. Trust me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. You know, I'm going to help you become the best platoon leader that you can be. And you know, I was just like, jump in feet first, figure this out. You know, like now, now you're, you know, went from, from being a West Point graduate to, you know, being a pilot to being an army ranger. And now I'm back at the bottom. I'm a platoon leader starting at the very beginning again. And now I'm actually responsible for, for human lives. And that there's a lot of responsibility that came with that on that first day. So once I showed up to my unit, it was about a year and a half before we deployed to Afghanistan. So there's a, a buildup of training. And, uh, and through that whole time, you know, I, I was kind of learning my way around as a, as a platoon leader, as an officer, learning how to run ranges, you know, take, take my soldiers out and get them qualified on their rifles and, you know, make sure they knew how to, how to take care of the helicopters. And at that same time, I was, I was flying with the flight company because I was a pilot also. So I both had to run my, run my platoon and also maintain my flight status, get certified. So when we deployed, I was ready to fly. And it was maybe about three or four months before going to Afghanistan. And we had a new crop of lieutenants come in. So, you know, I was, I was year group 09, I graduated West Point in 2009. Now we had the year group 2010 lieutenants show up and they all needed their platoons. So because I had already fulfilled my time as a platoon leader, I was moved over to staff and gave up my platoon to the new crop of lieutenants and was getting set up to be a battle captain, an operations officer for, um, for my unit going to Afghanistan. So um, I ended up getting selected to be on what was called the torch party, which is like going ahead to um, the very first part of your organization to go manage the handover between the outgoing unit and the incoming unit. So we were, we were replacing the 82nd Airborne Division, 82nd Combat Aviation Brigade in Afghanistan. And so I flew out maybe like six weeks before my, the rest of my unit went out. And um, when I arrived, I got, you know, I started, I started flying, right? I got certified to fly in the country. I started, you know, I started managing the, op you know, getting to know the operations and creating the procedures to hand over all these operations to my unit as they were coming in. And then my unit started, started coming in and then very quickly, you know, we just, we just took over all the operations when the 82nd left. So I was, I was managing um, the flight, like planning all the flights for all of the missions that we, we were sending out. So my unit had uh, something like 50 helicopters 
and 700, 700 soldiers. And we managed all of the helicopter operations in this region of Afghanistan where, where I was stationed, which is just north of Kabul at a place called Bagram Airfield. And so I was both flying and I was, on the days I wasn't flying, I was managing, um, I was like sending off the, the crews. I was briefing the pilots on what their mission was, what their routes were for the day, who they were flying, what they were doing, and you know, what the intelligence reports were, what the weather reports were, and then sending the, and we, we, our office, you know, our, 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 our operations center was right on the airfield. So right outside the airfield, you know, right outside the office was where all our helicopters were. So I would brief the pilots and their crews. They'd walk right out, get in their helicopters, you know, start up, call on the radios, take off, do their, do their missions. And, um, and when I, when I flew, I just, you know, I was just another pilot. I'd go get my, my briefing, walk out to my helicopter, you know, get started on my mission. So about two days a week, I would fly and and the other five days a week, four or five days a week, I'd be I'd be running the missions as the as the battle captain, um, and yeah, it was that was uh, that was a really intense was a really intense um, really intense experience. You know, dealt with a lot of a lot of challenging operations while I was in that role. Um, you know, first of all, when I first got the country, uh, I was getting certified to be a pilot. You know, to to fly and learn the rules of engagement and all of that. And I remember on one of my first flights before my unit even fully arrived, I was out flying a mission and uh, there was an aircraft that got shot down, like one of our own aircraft, the 82nd, um, an 82nd airborne air aircraft was shot down. And, uh, you know, you hear the, the call on the radio, which is fallen angel, which means that there's been a helicopter shot down. And I remember we were the nearest helicopter to that helicopter and, and we, you know, we we saw it. We saw the the smoke plume come up, and I remember me, me and my me and my co-pilot flew over there, and it was like there was nothing we could do at that point, right? The the helicopter's down, the 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 pilots are dead. Right? That was like the first. I mean, the first few weeks of me getting to Afghanistan and recognizing, you know, I didn't know these I didn't know these pilots except you know that I'd known them, seeing them in the operations center. But I remember it was like, well, what 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 are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna call it in. You know, we're going to make sure that 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 there's ground forces going in to you know to take care of whatever's going on, and we're going to fly, continue flying on our mission. Like that's what we're doing. So whenever we fly, we fly in uh, pairs. So two helicopters at the time when we're flying in Afghanistan, and the other helicopter had called it in, and you know, it essentially said the helicopter was just wreckage. Right? There's there's no way that somebody had sur survived, and we sent. You know, they sent in ground, uh, you know, ground forces to go and, and clear it. So no enemies came in and and um, and confirmed that the pilots were dead. And I remember flying back, you know, the hour back to our airfield and shutting down and walking inside to to just like just a silent operation center that was like just recognizing that we just lost like two pilots, you know, two two friends of a lot of people that were, you know, that 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 were part of that unit. And we had a moment of silence. And um, it, was, it was like, wow, we're, we're really in war. Like this is, this is war. And then as quickly as we had that moment of silence, we, we were back to running operations. Like seeing that right when I got to Afghanistan, knowing I, <laughs> we were doing nine month deployments, so I had nine months ahead of me. Like it, it, it gave me, it took away this feeling of like, oh man, it's awesome to be flying around in a helicopter in Afghanistan. This is a cool job too. This is, this is freaking serious. Like this is serious business, and I'm responsible not just for myself and coming home alive and my co-pilot, but I could have a helicopter full of soldiers in the back. Like I'm responsible for bring, you know bringing them home, and it 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 gave so much more gravity to the experience of being at war, experiencing that right at the beginning, like knowing that this isn't a training environment. There's like actual enemy out there with guns trying to trying to kill us, shoot us down. Um, there's malfunctions in the aircraft. There's, you know, you get tired when you're flying eight, 10 hours at a time, right? Like sometimes pilots go down because they fall asleep. And it, it just created an awareness in me that, you know, I wanted to come home. And I, I didn't want to be responsible for my death or anybody else's death for sure. But, but um, you know, I had nine months ahead of, of being a pilot, you know, of managing aircraft operations and actually flying missions and I had to take, you know, there's, there were the, you know, there wasn't a moment in the helicopter that I couldn't be tuned in and turned on and be prepared for anything to happen. And I couldn't get complacent. So once I was 
up and running in Afghanistan and, and when my unit was fully in place, I was you know, flying a couple times a week. Generally, a lot of the flights were a little bit boring, to be honest, because our our rules of engagement, you know, the way we had to fly was was that we always had to be at least like 3,000 feet above ground level, which was beyond what enemy, enemy you know, any known enemy weapons could could reach. And we flew, you know, with a lot of safety. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we would go and practice maneuvers like dust landings or, you know, land on the tops of mountains with, with like one wheel on it. And that was, that could be very terrifying, like under night vision goggles, right? Like all, all these crazy experiences of flying night vision goggles, like landing in a, in a dust out where you can't see anything at all. And you're just like kind of praying to, to, to hit the ground. But, but once I'm in the, once I was in the process of it, it just became normal. You know, like I went to the gym, I went to the dining, you know, the dining hall. I worked, you know, crazy shifts from like two o'clock in the morning to, to two o'clock in the afternoon. And I would just go fly a couple days a week. And then on the days that I worked at the, at the operations center, I would show up and, and do that job. But when I, it was like right after I got promoted to captain, which was about halfway through my deployment, I had just turned 25. I got, which is crazy when I think about it. I was 24 years old, you know, doing war, like responsible for, <laughs> so many lives in helicopters. And I turned 25, I got promoted to captain, and I was moved at that point into the day shift of, of the, uh, you know, of, of being a battle captain. So there are night shifts and there's day shifts. And the night shift is a whole lot slower. We're, we're much more active during the day. You know, maybe there's two missions going on at night and there's like eight going on during the day. So I, you know, I'd gotten promoted and I was now, you know, I'd had enough experience that you know, they decided, you know, the leadership decided to put me on the day shift. And I remember my very first day shift was, <laughs> ended up being one of the worst days of my life. I think my shift started at seven o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning and went for 12 hours. You're usually there for 14 hours because you're there early and stay late to do the handover. But I remember I was like, okay, all right, I'm, I'm doing, doing the big, the big boys job now. Like I'm a, I'm a daytime battle captain. I'm a captain, you know, I'm, I'm a ranger, you know, I got a ranger tap on my shoulder, like, I can handle this, like, I'm ready for this. And it was like the first three hours of, of the day of my shift, I think it was about 10 o'clock. It was the most calm day ever. There was, you know, the weather was perfect. Every mission was right on time. Everything was, was going exactly like I would have hoped it would go. And I was just like, okay, making it through this, like, I can do this. And all of a sudden, about 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, I hear on the radio, fallen angel. <laughs> so obviously, you know, in that moment, like my heart just drops. I'm like, what the fuck, you know, like what is happening? And, um, you know, I run over to the radio. I, you know, try to get information about, you know, what, what's going on. And I find out from one of our crews that's, that was out that one of the helicopters um, went down. So one of our Kiowas, our OH-58s, our observational helicopters, had gotten shot down um, maybe about 30 minutes away, 30, 30 minute flight away at another base that's, that had a higher threat level. So whenever we flew into this base, we needed to fly in with um, an Apache to kind of clear it out first before like a Black Hawk could go in and land there. So we get, you know, get the call on the radio, Fallen Angel, immediately go into firefighting mode. You know, like what information do we have? You know, get us everything we, we know about the helicopter that went down. It turns out the helicopter that went down, um, one of my friends was the pilot in it. And it was an observational helicopter, so there was two pilots. There's no passengers, two pilots. Helicopter went down. Um, I started calling in, you know, Air Force assets like A-10s and, you know, jets overhead and ground units to go and assess the situation. And all of a sudden we start getting calls that there's en heavy enemy fire. Still don't know. The situation of the aircraft that you know the pilots and um and i i'm starting to get all of these you know everybody shows up in the operations center i'm getting calls from generals i'm getting all the you know colonels running in i'm getting the co-pilots of you know or the, the the you know the, the friends and company mates of of those pilots in that helicopter you know everybody running in to figure out what's going on and everybody on my ass about you know, what's, the, what's going on on the ground? Like, what do you know? What are you doing about it? What, you know, are, have we sent in this person? Have we done that? You know, and I'm just getting like, just bombarded with, with things that I don't I remember at one point. I'm just like, I just yell at the entire, oper everybody in the operations center. I'm like, if you're, not, if you're not actively part of this right now, you know, get the F out of this. And I, 
and I cleared everybody out. I like locked the door and only the people that were part of the rescue operations were allowed in there because I, I just I had to focus and I had to I had to report up the chain what was going on while managing the recovery. I finally found out <laughs> how I don't have any idea how how these pilots survived, but they had survived the crash. And if you saw the helicopter, you're like, how did anybody survive that? So we um, ended up sending in some ground forces um, to go and recover these these pilots while they were under a heavy enemy fire. So they literally, you know, had to ha were able to grab their rifles, run out, out of the helicopter. Um, and the ground forces that were recovering them were actually Afghan National Army. So they weren't American forces. So they they ra they thought that they were getting a bunch of, you know, Af like Afghan, maybe Taliban running up on them and, you know, ran up weapons drawn and found out that, you know, those are actually friendly forces. So they were recovered. There was an enemy force, but that enemy force, I think, was was held at bay. I can't, I can't remember exactly what the details were, but I just know that when I talked to my friend afterward, he's like, yeah, we saw, you know, essentially a bunch of Afghan soldiers running up to us. And we're and like, at first we we're like, are these, are these enemies or are these, are these friendly? Like they didn't have any idea, um, but then quickly found out and were recovered and brought back to base. And, uh, you know, I remember seeing those guys walk through the door. First, they had to go to the hospital and get assessed and everything and see, you know, medically what was going on. They were, they both walked away from that crash. But I remember them walking through the door and thinking, man, like, like, just thank God, you know. And, um, and then after that, the aircraft on the ground was, was getting like heavy military fire, had heavy enemy fire. And we had to make a decision of whether we we're going to blow up the aircraft in place because it has, you know, confidential information in it or try to recover it. And we ended up deciding to recover it with a Chinook helicopter, going to sling load the helicopter at night. So it became a whole mission of, you know, like laying down ground, you know, suppressive fire, keeping the enemy at bay. So a rigger could come and, you know, rig up the, the helicopter and put it in the big cargo net and carry it back to the base, which ended up happening. And nobody else was injured. You know, no other aircraft went down. And I remember seeing this helicopter come back to our base, just like a crumpled mess. And like look like just like looking at it thinking how like how did anybody survive this I'm just so grateful that they did i don't think that they were actually shot down i think what ended up happening was they had a a mechanical um malfunction and because they were so close to the ground uh they didn't have time to do any recovery and actually ended up just crash landing so you know so anyway they they came back to the base and it's really interesting when you when you're a pilot I think this happens in the medical community too, if you're a doctor and you, you experience something traumatic. But when you're a pilot, um, once you get into an accident, the, they wanna get you back into the helicopter seat as quickly as possible so you don't develop like a phobia around it. So I remember like talking to my friend and being like, you know, you, like, like I remember him feeling nervous about getting back in the helicopter. And you know, and like, you kind of have to force yourself to get back in the seat so you don't, you don't develop this this fear of like of, of flying very quickly because it can start to fester, and so I always thought that was a very interesting you know perspective, and it actually influenced me quite a bit to think about like, yeah, like when when you have the fear, you you push through the fear, otherwise the fear owns you. Afghanistan was just like it was a it was a crazy experience. I mean, I I got in some of the best shape of my life, <laughs> you know, can't drink while you're out there, so I worked out a lot, you know, like I. I was really excited about, um, you know, like getting combat flight hours, you know, as much as it was, it was scary to fly. Like I flew around a lot of VIPs and senators and, you know, like I think John Kerry at one point was out there. I flew him around. I'd go down to the U.S. Embassy in Kabul quite a bit and, you know, go shopping around at like the, the little, um, the, the markets that are run by locals and you could buy like Persian rugs and cool things like that. Like there's different, different fun things like buying bootleg, you know, DVDs and sitting in your room with friends and watching DVDs. Like to some extent, it was like finding normalcy, you know, like just just a, a routine and a pattern in in war, which is which is crazy. And it was it was I was fortunate because I was at a major air base. Like I remember we would we would bring mail and like in huge duffel bags out to soldiers like on the Pakistan border. And I would look at the I would look at the letters and they'd be postmarked like four weeks earlier. And they're finally getting their mail, you know. And for me, like my wife was living with her parents in New Jersey at the time, which is where a major APO is. And so she could, she could literally put something in the mail to me and it would, it would arrive to me like two days later. 
And, and I just remember thinking just how grateful I was. Like I'd get, you know, get boxes and boxes of Girl Scout cookies and people would send us all these care packages and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, we did, we did Christmas parties. And, you know, I remember my wife sent me a, like a dehydrated birthday cake for my 25th, end of, my 25th birthday, you know, just like just enjoying, enjoying the experience as much as, as, much as I possibly could. Um, and then as I got closer to the end, I remember it was like, I, because I came out early, I got to go back home early. And it was, you know, maybe a month before my, my date to go home. And there was, um, there was an incident where there was a soldier that was set to go home, a pilot that was set to go home, maybe like a couple weeks before me. And he was at a, he was at an air base to the south. And because he was supposed to fly to Bagram and then from Bagram be on a plane to go back home. And I don't know exactly why he was going back home, but I remember this, this happening. And because there was a wet, there was some issue with the weather, the helicopter to go, go that he was going to get on to go bring him back to our air base was canceled and he was moved to the next day. And the soldier was then moved into transient housing because he had cleared out of his house, he cleared out of his, you know, his room, somebody else had moved into it. He was now in like, you know, in a temporary bunk. And he, and on that night, that base got rocket attacked and his bunk got hit and he died. Like just, just by, by shitty luck, you know, like got moved. <laughs> like he shouldn't have been there. He was there. He should have been on his way home. You know, his family's excited to see him and he gets killed by a rocket attack. Just be, you know, wrong place, wrong time. And it was so close to me going home that, man, that left such an impression in my head of, you know, I started having like fears when I would get into the helicopter of like, man, am I coming back from this one? You know, like, is, <laughs> like, you know, you start to wonder, like, you know, then you get down to the last week or two before leaving Afghanistan. And I'm like, I don't want to fly anymore. You know, <laughs> I don't want to like, I'm, I just want to be on, on this on this plane ride home. You know, I want to be back in my bed. And you have to I had to fight these these thoughts, you know, out of my mind and tell myself, no, just like those are those are thoughts of complacency. Those are thoughts of weakness. I've got a mission to do. I've got to stay in the game. Like the worst thing I can do is start to, you know, just to dwell on these kinds of thoughts. You know, being an officer in Afghanistan wasn't, I don't think, that much different than being being a, a soldier with one one key difference. If you were a captain, I think we actually ended up making it first lieutenant because we had enough rooms. But if you were a first lieutenant or higher rank, you got your own room in Afghanistan, like your own, they were these containerized, I think it was called, we call them CHUs, CHU, containerized housing units, which is like shipping containers essentially. But if you were, um, if you were an officer for the most part, you, we got our own rooms to ourselves, which was, which was a blessing, you know, after being in, in an operation center, you know, around a couple dozen people, like all day, every day with a lot of activity, it was really, really always, I was grateful to come back to a quiet room that was just my own space. And I could just like be in peace for, for a period of time, like pull my shades down, you know, turn on some music and just, just chill on my own. Like that was, but besides that, you know, it was, um, you know, I always thought it was interesting when I would tour like a naval, a naval, uh, like aircraft carrier. And you could see like, it's very different, like the, the officer quarters versus the enlisted quarters, you know, and how many bunks they have stacked up on top of each other versus, you know, versus officers, maybe have two to a room and, and enlisted have like six, right? It was very different. Um, but yeah, in, 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 in Afghanistan for us, I, I always thought like, I always liked to be with the soldiers. I was always, you know, I was never like one to just hang out with officers. I like to really, you know, like learn from soldiers. I had a lot of curiosity, you know, and I, I like, I, I really felt like it was an important, it was a responsibility of mine to, you know, to role model, like good, good behavior to, to be, be doing the work. You know, if I see soldiers like picking up, moving stuff from one place to another, or, you know, doing, doing, doing laborious work. Like I would, I would just go, you know, jump in with them and do it. Cause I, you know, for me, it's, it's like a, it's like a privilege to be able to, to, to role model appropriate leadership because you're setting the example for, you know, who the next, the next leaders in the military are. I was in Afghanistan for, for nine months. I got back around 2013 and uh, like mid 2013 and I got out of the army in, in early 2016. So I only had about three years left in the military. And in that time I went to the military, I, I transitioned into the military intelligence course for captains, um, which was in Arizona. And I spent nine months doing military intelligence school. And from there I went and became a company commander 
in Fort Eustis, Virginia, in, in charge of a, a unit that trains uh, trains soldiers who are specializing in um, in in mechanic work for helicopters. So I took over a training unit, became a company commander for the last two years of my time in the military. And then I started setting my sights on getting out and you know, started <laughs> putting my resume together, applying for jobs. I, I knew that I wanted to get out of the military after my obligation was complete. And, and so I started just getting myself set up for that. I had felt like I always wanted to get out of the military after my obligation was complete. Now back to my origin story, like I saw West Point and the military as a means to take ownership of my life and kind of emancipate myself from my parents and, and, and set myself up for, for a lifetime of success. I never, I didn't like f ever feel like I joined the military because I wanted to be a career military officer, um, you know, or, or, or f for any other reason. It was really because I wanted to have this experience like early in life. Um, I wanted to experience West Point. I wanted to become an army officer, and then I wanted to figure out what was next for me. And I felt early on in my military career that the army as a career wasn't for me. Um, you know, I I I got into a lot of you know challenging situations with with senior officers or leaders that I you know didn't respect. There was a lot of you know I, I had a lot of like challenging command climates, which I really you know, where I didn't have respect for my leaders or, I, you know, I felt like I was, I was, you know, being forced to do things that maybe morally I wasn't aligned with. I was excited to, for the first time in my life, you know, I was 14 years old when I put on a uniform. I was 28 years old when I took one off. So I was literally 14 years out of 28, half of my life I spent in a military uniform. And I really felt, you know, I didn't feel like I was running away from the army, but I, I, felt, I felt like I wanted to run toward having like complete freedom of my life for the first time, like choose what I wanted to wear, choose where I wanted to work. You know, if I didn't want to move to a certain location, that could be my independent choice. So for the first time in my life, I really wanted to experience like true freedom and ownership of my direction. And while I was active duty, I earned my, my master's in business. So I was ready to like move into a, a corporate job and start, you know, start making good money and, and, and build, you know, build the next phase of my life. So, on the, on the day that I could sign out of the Army is the day that I signed out of the Army. I was in company command up until that day, so I literally passed off my guide on, you know, handed over my company to my successor, and went right from there to the, you know, the Human Resources um, office, signed out of the Army, drove off base for the last time, took my uniform off. It was March 4th, 2016, and I went to start packing up my house. And I already had a job lined up, so I knew that I was moving after that to Indiana, so moving from Virginia to Indianapolis. Driving off the base for the last time in uniform uh, was, <laughs> there was a mix between relief and like trepidation. And I, I remember feeling a very similar feeling when I drove off uh, West Point for the last time. And you know, the, they talk a lot about West Point, like for the last time when you see West Point in your rear view mirror, you know, and I remember that in my head. And I remember driving off of West Point and looking in my rearview mirror and seeing it for the last time, you know, when, the day that I graduated and being like, wow, yeah, like next time I come back here, it's not gonna be, I'm not gonna feel the same about it. I'm gonna be, you know, not in the experience, I'm gonna be beyond the experience. And it felt very similar when I left uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia. And I remember driving off and very deliberately looking in the rearview mirror to see the base like disappearing in my rearview mirror and just feeling so much excitement about the next phase of my life. And also like this trepidation of like the unknown, you know, like now it, now it really was what I had hoped it was going to be, which was my decision. You know, it's, it's no longer the army telling me what to do. It's now me like taking full control and agency of the course that my life would take and complete ownership, like what I had, what I had wanted or what I told myself I wanted. So there was a little bit of fear of like, man, is this the right decision? I know it's the right decision. I'm excited about it, but like what, what is beyond the unknown, you know, like, uh, I'm going to figure it out, you know, so it was, it was mostly excitement, a little bit of fear, but um, I remember driving off base, just, just really excited to figure out what the next phase of life was going to feel, feel like. I drove off base March 4th, 2016. Um, 
on March 8th, 2016, so four days later, I'm packing up my house. My wife is at, at work. She's still finishing up her job. She was a nurse and worked at a local hospital. And I remember getting a text from a, a friend who's another classmate from West Point saying, hey, man, I'm so sorry to hear about Taylor. I knew you guys were close. I was like, what? Like, what? I was like, what, what are you talking about? And I quickly jumped over to Facebook and in and, and the news, and I saw all over Facebook and in major news sources that my be like literally my best friend in the world um, was murdered. And he was murdered in a stabbing attack by, by a terrorist in Israel, actually. And this was really, um, this, was, this was the darkest moment in my entire life, was, was, get, was, was getting that message and learning in that moment that my friend had just died. So, so my friend Taylor Force, we went to high school together. We were roommates in, in my military high school. We, we applied to West Point together. We went to West Point together. We graduated together. Um, he was, you know, a saber bearer at my wedding. He was, he was actually the guy that he swatted my wife on the butt, you know, and if, you know, the, the, there's the saber arts that you do when you leave the, the ceremony of a wedding. And, and, you know, if it's a military wedding, off, uh, soldiers or officers will get up and they'll cross sabers and you'll walk under the saber tunnel. And then as you get to the back of the saber tunnel, the last two soldiers will cross their, their, their sabers in front of you so you can't pass. And they say, like, you must kiss to pass, you know, and you kiss. And then, and then the, as you're walking through, one of the saber bearers swats the spouse on the butt and says, so in my case, it was, welcome to the army, Mrs. Halu. Like, it's, you know, it's a, whole, <laughs> it's a whole tradition. So Taylor, he, he volunteered to do that. He was like, I want that role. <laughs> and so he got that role, you know, and he was just one of my best friends through life. And he had gotten out of the army two years before I did. And he was doing his, his MBA program through Vanderbilt University out of Nashville. And, you know, I was talking to him as I was getting ready to leave the Army about what it was like, you know, kind of getting my mind right. And, um, and I was born in Israel. Uh, and, and, and so I had seen on Facebook and I talked to Taylor and, and saw that he was on a trip to the Middle East with his, with his school, with Vanderbilt, like doing an entrepreneurship program. So he was in Jordan and then he went over into Israel. And while he was in Israel, he was just walking down the street one day at nighttime in Tel Aviv. And um, a, a, there was a terrorist that ran around stabbing a bunch of people. And I think, I think he injured about do a dozen people and, and Taylor was the only one that was killed. So he was stabbed and bled out, bled out right there on, you know, right there on the ground. And, um, and that, that's that, like learning that, that, that crushed me more than anything I've ever experienced in my life. It was like, going from such hope about what's coming next in life to all of a sudden like flying to my friend's memorial, you know, and like, and, and knowing that somebody who was, he was so loved. There was like a couple hundred people at his memorial service, like, so loved, such a good human being. He had survived Iraq. He had survived Afghanistan. You know, he was working on his MBA. He was, you know, he was dating somebody, you know, he's, he was living a life. Um, and it just ended just like, just like in a moment. Um, and it, it really crushed me and, it, and, and, and it didn't just, it wasn't just that, but it was so much other trauma that was really unlocked through that. Like the trauma of losing my father to suicide, the, the trauma of, you know, seeing, seeing violence and death in war, you know, the child, the, the, the trauma of a really challenging childhood. It was like all of that kind of, kind of felt like it dumped on me right as I was at this very consequential pivot point in my life for the first time of going from soldier to civilian. And man, it, it wrecked me. Like it, it really wrecked me. And I, I, I didn't know it at the time, but that, that plunged me into like PTSD and depression that I didn't, that I didn't, I didn't even take seriously or recognize for years, you know, years of suffering after that moment. So my, my wife and I ended up moving to uh, Indianapolis where I had a job set up. Um, I started working that job. It was, you know, it was, uh, for, it was, it was in technology, um, you know, man managing technology for like healthcare companies. And I, you know, I did well in my job. I, I, was, I was always a top performer, but my marriage was really struggling. My wife and I were arguing all the time. I didn't, I didn't recognize how much how much negative energy I was carrying. Um, I would sit out on my, my, I mean, I would sit on my balcony at night, like by myself, 
just just weeping, like thinking about my friend Taylor, thinking about like you know how how tragic it is, thinking about how tragic life is, and and just not able to pull myself pull myself out of that space, and and at the same time I was away from the camaraderie of my military unit, so I didn't have. I didn't have friends in the new location, you know? I didn't really even know how to make friends at that point in time. Like usually you show up to a unit and your friends are kind of built in. So was, I, felt, I felt like utterly alone and so depressed and had no idea what to do uh, about it at all. So that went on for about three years. I managed most of it under the surface, right? I tried to not show anything that was going on inside of me on the outside. My wife certainly experienced you know, the brunt of it, of having to live with, with me and this, you know, and, and not, not really recognizing how, like, like how, what the depths were that I was experiencing because I wasn't capable of communicating them and I didn't even know how to communicate them. And uh, a few years later, so we got out of the army in 2016, um, at the end of 2018, so about two and a half years later, my marriage was in a, in, in a very challenging place and my wife and I decided to, we had to make a big change. So we, I quit my job and we moved to New Jersey um, to be closer to my wife's family and to move for a job that she was taking. And we moved to New Jersey, it's end of 2018. So I've been out of the army for about two and a half years at this point. And I'm starting to interview for jobs. And I just honestly, like I get, I got offers to a bunch of like very good offers to different jobs. And I couldn't, I couldn't fathom going back to work at that point. I was so devastated in my life and I was, didn't feel like passionate about anything. I felt like, I felt lost. And the idea came to me to hike the Appalachian Trail. Uh, I'd first seen the Appalachian Trail when I was actually at ranger school because in the mountain phase of ranger school in Northern Georgia is where the beginning point of the Appalachian Trail is. And I remember seeing it on a map while I'm doing like, you know, doing, doing ranger school like fully camoed you know with all my gear I remember it was like March and we're doing a an operation and and I remember seeing the Appalachian Trail on the map and it's at nighttime and we're walking by some tents and I remember seeing like some some campers or whatever hikers like peek their heads out of the tents and see a platoon of like fully armored rangers coming at them which must have been ter terrifying like Red Dawn you know <laughs> something crazy but in that moment I was like I remember looking up the Appalachian Trail when I got back home, like wondering what it was and learning that it was a 2,200 mile foot trail that goes through 14 states from Georgia up through Maine and telling myself, like I kept a, a bucket list, you know, kind of list and I put it on there and told myself, yeah, maybe when I'm retired, this is, this is an adventure I'll take, putting it out of my head. So I was living in New Jersey. I couldn't fathom going back to work. And now it's like January, February of 2019. And it's coming up on the third year anniversary of my friend's death on March 8th. And I, I don't know why, but I just told myself, I'm gonna hike the Appalachian Trail. Like, I'm gonna do it right now. Like, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna go back to work. I need to take a break. I need to take time for myself. And I decided to um, start hiking the Appalachian Trail in Georgia on March 8th, 2019, the third anniversary of my friend's death. Um, and I used that time to, to write a lot, to reflect. My friend's family, Taylor's family, sent me his dog tags, so I carried his dog tags on my shoulder, on my pack, the entire hike. You know, I got, and I got to get used to telling his story. And I spent four months, 123 days hiking from Georgia to Maine. And I met a lot of other veterans and a lot of other trauma survivors along the way. I met, I met Marines who were, you know, EOD, you know, explosive ordnance who, you know, their, their job in Iraq was detonating IEDs and they had lost friends who had, you know, blown up right in front of their eyes and friends who had gone back home and, you know, had, had ended their lives. But it was the first time I really got the chance to start to talk about the trauma that I experienced and recognize that, you know, so many other people have very extreme traumatic experiences and we don't really get to talk about it. But on this, on this hike, you know, it's like you're, you're in an environment where you cut through all the bullshit. You know, there's no need for trivial small talk, right? You just get, you meet really interesting people. I met, I met Marines. I met, you know, Air, Air Force veterans, Navy veterans, like guys that are still some of my best friends to this day. And we were able to connect so deeply because on, these, on this hike, 
we could have real conversations, you know, out of out of the normal bullshit of of life that we deal with. And we're not, you know, going back home, you know, going like meeting up once a week. We're like we're in this together. And it really felt like it was the start of my healing journey. Um, you know, I had friends that I met who were Marines who were recovering alcoholics because of their, you know, the, the, the experience of the trauma that they had. And they were using this hike to, you know, be away from substances and hold each other accountable. So it was, it was, a, it was a great lesson for me in, in learning about other people. And in, every time people would ask me about my dog tags, right, it was like, it's hard for me to talk about it. It's like I'd start crying every time I told the story. So it was like getting used to, for me, um, starting to starting to process that trauma and you know just through just through constant conversation and every time you know i was able to talk about it right there's a level of vulnerability that you open up and then other people share their traumatic experiences with you and you know i started to feel less alone and then by the end of the hike um, it took me four months to the day so i started march 8th and i finished on july 8th and that very last summit in Maine, it's a very hard, hard mountain to climb. It's called Mount Katahdin in Baxter State Park. Um, my friend Taylor's family, his parents and his sister came out, came out to Maine. And um, Taylor's dad and sister and my wife climbed that very last mountain. And we get to the very top. And you know, I, touch, I touch the terminus sign of, of the Appalachian Trail. And it's like, I've just had 2,200 miles. And um, I remember reaching up and I took took the dog tags off of my pack and I went to go hand them back to Taylor's dad and he said they're yours to keep so man it was it was an incredibly powerful powerful experience there like it you know like sharing in that trauma and and, and uh just re recognizing the the gravity of of like what I had accomplished and um you know how I was how I was remembering my friend. And, uh, you know, that after that, we hiked back down the five miles down the mountain and <sighs> I started my drive back to New Jersey. I was just going to ask, did you walk all the way back? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. man, you know, <laughs> when I got to New Jersey, it was like the seventh or eighth state on the Appalachian Trail. And by that point, I'd hiked 1,200 miles. And, you know, that's where grit and perseverance kicks in because it's like, I, was, I remember telling myself, it was my 10th anniversary when I was going through, through, um, through New Jersey and I went home. It was Memorial Day weekend. I went home and spent that weekend with my wife. And it was so hard to get back to the trail and start hiking again because I was telling myself, well, I've already hiked 1,200 miles. I can do another 1,000 miles, theoretically, right? But it's very different than getting back out there and hiking those miles. And so the getting started back up and hiking the rest of the way, like it took grit and perseverance and dedication. And, you know, it was another reason I was glad to be carrying the dog tags because if I didn't have a purpose, you know, maybe I wouldn't have chosen to finish it. But if I didn't have a purpose, maybe, maybe I wouldn't have started in the first place. So I get back to New Jersey. It's, it's uh, about July, August of 2019. You know, I was blogging during my hike and um, I had a boss who was kind of following my journey and she reached out to me uh, like September, August of, of, of that year. So like, right as I was getting done with the trail and she said, Hey, you know, I'm hiring at my comp my new company. If, you know, once you're done hiking, if you want to get back into work, I'd be happy to, you know, bring you into my company. You know, I know you're a top performer or whatever. And then, so I said, okay, let's check it out. I interviewed for that company and I, I took the job and I was, uh, that the, the, it was another technology sales job. And the beginning of it, there was a lot of travel to our headquarters in Dallas, Texas to do like sales training. So I remember for the first six months, I was flying to Dallas from New Jersey um, for six different weeks going through training at this time. And it was spread out over those six months. So during that time, I actually went and saw the VA and I talked to them about mental health and I was diagnosed with PTSD and put on antidepressants. And it was the first time I really started to take my mental health seriously. And I didn't want to be on antidepressants, but I was willing to try anything because I didn't want to be in pain anymore. On the, the sixth, the, that sixth week of training, it was about six months into my job. It was the, the last week of February, first week of March of 2020, which is right when the pandemic started happening. So I was literally at, at my headquarters, um, like graduating from this program with my CEO, like, you know, recognizing all of us. And he said, hey, you guys have heard of this 
this pandemic thing that's coming, you guys, like we were a 50,000 person company. He was like, you guys are gonna, you know, after graduation, obviously you're flying back home and that's the last travel that's being, that I'm authorizing for the company until we figure out what this thing is. So I literally flew back home and I was in New Jersey, which, like close to New York City. And, you know, it was like the epicenter of, of the pandemic. So I literally got home and all of a sudden it was, the pandemic was upon us. And my wife was working at a hospital. She was in healthcare. So she was inundated with her role. My job went fully remote. Like my wife's job went mostly remote. We were working and living right on top of each other in a small apartment in New Jersey. And it was it, like when that happened, when that pandemic happened and all, everything changed, like I thought things were going in the right direction. Like I was getting back into the flow of work, like starting to make friends a little bit, but the pandemic became a huge setback. And all of a sudden my wife and I were bickering again. We were not, you know, we're not getting along. I, I, I wasn't feeling any better from my depression, you know, from the antidepressants. And, um, and in that time I had heard, and this was really interesting, a friend told me because he knew that I was struggling. He, um, he told me that he had heard about something called psychedelics and magic mushrooms and that they were, they could be very effective for mental, mental health. And for me, it was like, wait, what? I thought these are, they, you know, these are what hippies do to get high and like, you know, trip out. And so I started doing research and I, and I learned about psilocybin mushrooms, like magic mushrooms. And I didn't know how to acquire, you know, mushrooms. Like, I'm still like a, you know, West Point officer in my mind, like drugs are bad, you know, I shouldn't be, <laughs> shouldn't, like, where am I gonna seek these drugs out? But I really wanted to experience this. And so I just decided to grow my own mushrooms. Like I, I bought, I bought, my, I bought, you know, spores and I bought the, the ingredients that I needed and I started this grow, but my, my wife was like so against it. You know, she thought, she, she, she thought it was like me becoming a druggie or, you know, I was like, like I shouldn't have to turn to illegal drugs to, you know, to, to feel better. And she didn't have any idea about any of it. So I kind of kept it to myself. And I remember literally it was, it was July of 2020. It was right as my mushrooms were, were finishing growing my wife tells me she wants a divorce. So, and that, and that, you know, obviously was another gut punch, right? Like I wasn't looking forward to that. <laughs> I didn't even know it was coming. Um, truly, you know, I, I knew my wife and I weren't getting along and I always thought, you know, I was committed. I was still committed to her. And I always thought, well, if we were going to get a divorce, it would probably be me that brought it up to her because she's, you know, she's been, you know, along for the ride with me for this, through this whole journey. And I never, I didn't ever foresee that she would want a divorce. And, and when she told me that, you know, I went into firefighting mode very briefly and we, you know, hired marriage counselors and, and I quickly understood that if she's bringing divorce to me, like she's made up her mind probably months ago. Like it's not like in a moment that she's brought this to me after an 11 year marriage. And, and, and very quickly after that, I recognized that I was actually kind of being give, given a gift of, of freedom to pursue my own life, knowing that my life with my wife wasn't serving me. You know, I was in deep depression. I needed to make a change. I didn't want to be living in New Jersey, but my wife didn't want to move. And so we didn't have any kids and decided to you know, just split our assets up. And I packed I left everything in New Jersey, but what I could fit in my Ford Escape, in including my, my recently grown mushrooms. And I drove all the way across the country in 36 hours straight to Las Vegas, where my brother lives and, you know, lived at the time. And I just decided that's where I, my job was remote so I could live wherever I wanted to. I wanted to move west and that there was a reason for me to be there in Las Vegas. And I drove all the way out. I found a fully furnished apartment. I got moved in and on that very first weekend, I told myself I was gonna have my first psychedelic um, experience. And that first weekend came and it was a Saturday and I took a big dose of mushrooms and, uh, and had that first psychedelic experience and everything changed. <laughs> I remember weighing out the mushrooms and they, uh, five grams of mushrooms is considered a heroic dose. And I remember weighing out like four and a half grams, telling myself, well, I'll, I'm not gonna do a full heroic dose because I don't know what's, you know, but I'll take slightly fewer, it's crazy. And, you know, I had grown these mushrooms, it was crazy to me, but I, I was like, uh, maybe this is gonna be nothing. Like I was afraid of it being underwhelming rather than overwhelming. But I remember I took that dose and I went and sat outside on my balcony and, and I smoked a joint and I was really happy to be in Las Vegas because, um, you know, in, in New Jersey, marijuana was illegal still, cannabis was illegal. And 
um, and I had sought it out because it did help with my anxiety. And in and my wife like demonized it. You know, I always had to if I wanted to smoke, I had to do it in in private, and and like take a shower and brush my teeth afterward. You know, <laughs> like hide the smell. But I remember sitting on my patio, like waiting for the mushrooms to kick in, like feeling freedom for the first time ever. Like, wow, it's just this is the first time I've ever lived alone in my entire life and have my own space. And nobody's here judging me, and I'm allowed to smoke on my balcony. It's completely legal, you know. <laughs> and I remember by the time that that joint was done, like I looked up and I saw the stucco pattern all around me on the walls, just like moving and shifting. And I was like, okay, these mushrooms are working, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like something's happening. And like by about 45 minutes in, man, I was plunged into into a deep psychedelic experience where I felt like I like psychologically was visiting like each traumatic moment in my life, like from my, fa my father, like, you know, I had such resentment for a man that I never knew because I blamed him for, you know, for my, for my bad childhood and for, for abandoning his family, you know, and, and in my head, I, I was able to pivot. You know, I used to say that my dad committed suicide and, you know, and when I talked about suicide, like use the word committed and I changed that to saying died by suicide. And it seems like a small change, but you know, words have meaning and, those, and, and the words we use influence our thoughts too. And when, you, when I thought about it from the perspective of died by suicide, a cause of death versus a crime, I stopped feeling like a victim from it. You know? And I started more seeing this man who I never knew through a lens of empathy you know, and sadness for, for a relationship I never got to have. And you know, like not being able to understand what had driven a person to to take their their own life, you know, my father, and you know, I started to see my mom in with empathy and the the plight that she had been on, and you know how I'd I'd held onto such resentment toward her and resentment toward my wife, and most of all, like self hatred, like self criticism, self loathing, like even though I'd been so successful and had all these accomplishments, man, I was my own worst critic through it all like I beat myself up so much and during that psychedelic experience I was able to start having empathy and kindness and love for myself and being grateful for myself and you know instead of thinking of myself as the victim of life circumstances I started viewing all the life circumstances I had experienced as as part of what made me who I am and becoming grateful for myself and the journey that I had taken and I came out of that experience about six hours later. I was totally convinced that I had taken the red pill, like in the Matrix, and <laughs> had ejected from the Matrix and was never going, going back. Like, I was completely convinced that everything that was existing in my world was just a figment of my imagination, and I was utterly alone for the rest of existence, and that was it. <laughs> like, and I remember, like, not wanting to call anybody on my phone because I'd read a lot of things that said, like, don't contact anybody while you're, <laughs> while you're, you know, while you're tripping. And, but I had this, this complete and utter belief that it didn't matter if I called anybody, nobody was going to pick up because I was the only one that existed. But I decided to call my mom of all people, who was pretty strange to me at that point. You know, I hadn't talked to her in, in years. I mean, I talked to her, but like, I hadn't connected with her in years, only out of obligation. And I would avoid her phone call when it would come, you know, like three or four times and call her back, you know, after a week or two had gone by. But I, I decided to FaceTime my mom and, and she answered the phone. And I was like blown away that she had answered the phone because I didn't think that there was anybody else in the world. I was like, mom, I took a bunch of mushrooms and I'm, you know, I'm tripping the fuck out, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I'm dead. And my mom's like, okay. Like she very quickly like calmed me down. She got me to breathe. Um, and, I, and I learned in that conversation <laughs> that my mom had taken a lot of LSD in the 70s. <laughs> And so she was very familiar with with hard trips and you know psychedelic experiences, and we connected on that. And you know I talked to her about the entire journey of my experience and the, you know what I had what I had learned and what I had overcome and what was changing in my mind. And you know we talked for probably two hours and I hung up the phone and and then I sat and watched YouTube videos the rest of the night about about mushroom trips to be like what the fuck did I just experience because it was so intense and so life changing. And I, and I wanted to comprehend what I had just gone through. I remember waking up the next day and getting up and going for a hike. You know, outside of Las Vegas, there are a lot of mountains. And I, and I love that about Vegas, that there's a lot of outdoor space. And I went for a hike. And I remember taking, like, some pictures of myself, you know, some selfies while, and, like, posting them online. 
And I remember my wife, who I was still in contact with because we weren't divorced yet. You know, our divorce was still being finalized. And we were still communicating in a way that was like, you know, like, all right, like we were still, we were still rooting for each other. You know, we were still, I wanted her to be happy. She wanted me to be happy. And we were trying to do it as, as, as you know, as healthy as possible to, to set us each up for success. So I remember she sent me a message when she saw my picture and she was like, Josh, I've never seen you, like, I've never seen you that happy. Like that's your, your smile doesn't like, she was like, you're glowing in the picture. Your smile looks real. Like, like now I've looked at your other photos and it, and you know, I, I, I recognize something different in you. And I heard that from multiple people. I was like, what? Like, there's no, like, there's no way, you know, but I felt joy in my heart that I didn't like have had never experienced before. Um, not that everything was solved, but like, it was a big paradigm shift. And, and it was, it was a recognition in that moment that I had gone through some significant change. And I was at the start of a brand new phase of my life that was, that was mine to determine what to do with it. And it was a very exciting and liberating and a gratifying period of time. So I, I started a psychedelic company about a year ago. It's called PsychX and um, recently launched a, a retreat company called Sacred Soldier, um, where we take soldiers with PTSD and mental illness through four day ayahuasca, you know, plant medicine retreats, holistic wellness retreats. So um, we certainly use ayahuasca and psychedelic um, substances, but we create holistic wellness programs that, that include things like yoga and meditation and breath work and you know, different, different holistic wellness um, techniques that we couple with, with these you know, incredible experiences under psychedelic medicine um, with other veterans and a supportive community um, over the course of these four days that are incredibly transformational for individuals who, who suffer from PTSD and mental illness, you know, and, and, and addiction and, and other forms of trauma. I mean, I've seen such incredible transformation, you know, just like I've seen in myself, I've seen it in so many other people because of this specific work. And so it wasn't a straight line to opening this company, you know, so I, my first psychedelic experience was almost four years ago. And then I spent the next three years really, really having two lives, like a professional life and a personal life, like a shadow life. And I didn't, I didn't cross the two. I, I never imagined that I would be out in the open about doing this work until it became so compelling that I couldn't, couldn't think about anything else but to leave my job and, and dedicate myself fully to this. But over the course of those first three years, you know, I continued diving deep with myself. I, I started work, at any friends that I had who were veterans who were, who were struggling with PTSD, I would invite them to come visit me in Las Vegas and I would take them through the experiences and see these you know, incredible transformations just like overnight. At, at that time it was just with mushrooms and just you know, sitting together in my house and helping somebody work through you know, their trauma from, from war, their trauma from you know, survivor's guilt, from, from whatever. And then I started sitting with my mom. You know, I actually invited my mom and my mom was open to it. And we started taking psychedelic mushrooms together and, and healing our relationship, like really, really understanding how, how trauma has passed down from generation to generation, like that the trauma that she experienced in her childhood from her mother, that was exactly what she passed down in my, my childhood, you know, irrespective of, of my father's suicide, like she still had trauma that she passed down to me. And even seeing how my siblings pass it down to their children. And my mom and I decided, you know, we were, we were, gonna, we were gonna end that cycle. You know, we were gonna really heal. And we went through that effort. And it's been, it's been a beautiful journey with my mom and really feeling like I've healed that, that, that wound with, with my only surviving biological parent, with the person who brought me into this world which gave me a lot of resolute foundation for continuing this journey that I've been on. So about a year ago, I finally decided that I wanted to, to move into this industry. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was terrified to come out, you know, come out of the psychedelic closet and talk about, the, like, talk about my experiences. And, and it felt like kind of a burn the bridge or burn the boats moment where it's like, all right, there's no coming back from this. Like, I'm... I'm, I'm either all in or I'm, or I'm not in at all. And I decided to be all in. And I decided to be all in where it started was go, I went to a psychedelic conference in Denver last year. Um, and it was a week long psychedelic conference and it ended up being the largest psychedelic conference in history. There were like 12,000 people there and 500 speakers from like Aaron Rodgers talking about his ayahuasca experiences to 
you know, Michael Pollan, who wrote the series How to Change Your Mind. You know, there's all like Rick, Rick Perry, the former governor of, of, uh, of Texas, talking about his support for, for psychedelic medicine because he saw how transformational it was for a Medal of Honor recipient that he sponsored, you know, and everybody across the board. And there were so many veteran groups that were, that were all, all collecting together here at, in this. I mean, that was one of the biggest, um, the, like the biggest demographics of people at this conference was they're like veterans, you know, there's indigenous communities, there's physicians and doctors and enthusiasts, but, but the veteran community was so well represented and, and outspoken about how impactful, like, you know, I, an ayahuasca experience had been, a mushroom experience had been, you know, healing, healing together with other people under, you know, in, 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 in ceremony with psychedelic substances and how it helped you know, people change their minds and, and, and get past suicidality and, and self-harm and things like that and alcoholism. And I was, I was finally like, wow, I've found my tribe. Like, this is where I belong. And, and I moved very quickly from that to um, taking a leave of absence from my job and, and really thinking hard about the type of um, company I wanted to open and how I wanted to get into, like, I didn't know anything really about entrepreneurship at the time, but how I was going to get into the industry and just start a business. And I had saved some money and I, you know, I had some mentors and I just decided to leave my company and, and, and start and start my own. And over the course of the last, you know, last six or eight months since I've been on this journey, man, I have seen just such incredible, powerful transformations happen right before my eyes. I mean, like literally people showing up who it is their like very last ditch attempt, you know, that they've tried everything that they've been on, you know, dozens of pills from the from the VA and have been taking pills and it's just numbing them and they still feel depression, they still feel hopelessness and they've already tried to attempt suicide multiple times and they're like, you know, I'm I like I don't want to live anymore and show up and come through an experience over 4 days or just sit in in a one day ceremony and feel the power of the combination of medicine and support and community and connection, like connection with yourself, connection with other people, and and get out of you know get out of their own heads the same way that I did on my mushroom trip, and come up to like the thirty thousand foot view and recognize how beautiful life is, you know, like recognize inside, not just not just logically in your mind, like telling yourself, oh, I shouldn't I shouldn't feel depressed, but actually not feeling depressed anymore, and like feeling what that feels like in your body, and I've seen that just happen time and time again, and it's not just extreme cases and not just people that are like ready, you know, ready to end their lives. It's people who have had military sexual trauma, you know, or, 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 or lost a family member to suicide and they're a survivor or, you know, or have, have an addict, have some addiction that they're trying to handle, or just are wondering if life could be better than it is. You know, maybe life feels, you know, like not very joyous and they have some level of depression, you know, since leaving the military and not, having a community around them and wanting to discover that like anything across the board but i've seen i've seen it all you know people show up just you know in the in the best advice i always have for people is just surrender to the experience you know surrender to like don't try to control it just be just just welcome welcome the medicine you know the the medicine being you know ayahuasca mushrooms whatever the, the psychedelic medicine is but the medicine also being within yourself which is choosing to take the healing journey seriously and choosing to put yourself first like on an aircraft when you're told you know put your oxygen mask on first before helping other people right like we're a lot of us especially veterans we're very selfless people and we put ourselves last often but what i've learned is that you've got to be that person that puts on the oxygen mask on and takes care of yourself so that you can be the best version of yourself for everybody else that you want to serve in life and so when you take your healing journey seriously and when you show up ready to do this deep work, you're putting yourself first in a way that creates ripple effects way beyond what you can possibly imagine. Because on the other side of taking your own healing journey seriously is living a life where you're not trapped in the past anymore. You're not anchored to negative thoughts and negative patterns and beliefs about yourself or the world. and and. I've really experienced that you become free. You become free to become involved in your in community and society and your children's lives and take on new hobbies and develop friendships. 
you know, and, and wake up with a smile on your face and connect with your parents who you haven't seen in a while, right? Because you're getting out of your own way because you've decided that it's time to heal whatever's holding me back, to trust the process, to trust the unknown that's on the other side. And then once you arrive on the other side into that unknown, finding it to be a place of freedom, you know, that, that, that is, is now the new foundation, you know, the, the higher level foundation that you're operating from anymore, you know, for, 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 for this point forward. And it sustains, it sustains beyond the ceremony, it sustains, you know, months into the future. And if it's properly integrated back into the way that you go about living your life and the way we do it with our company is we provide continuous support and community support and integration guidance and things like that beyond just showing up for the retreat and going home. Um, we, we provide continuous support, you know, along your journey. And when, when that is, when that is um, performed well and integrated back into the way that you go about living your life, into your family life, into your home life, then those feelings that you get, that, that change in your psyche and your perspective is sustained well beyond the retreat and, and shows up in, in the way that you show up in the world and in the rest of your life. And it's beautiful to see every single time. Guilt and shame is something that a lot of, a lot of people carry. I think everybody carries in some way or another. And some, some cases are much worse than others. You know, some people, you know, I've, I've met people in ceremony who, who open up about some of their, you know, darkest secrets afterward because they're comfortable and they've, it, they've been able to bring it to the surface. Like, you know, I've, I've met people who have, who have, you know, hit, hit and run, for instance, and carried that, that guilt of ending somebody's life forever. Right? Like, think, like, yeah, we can judge that person for doing that thing, but then that person judges themselves and beats themselves up, you know, and lives with their own form of trauma for forever, right? After that, the, the experience of going through this healing journey, it is, it is deep work because in combination with the medicine, the medicine is allowing you to create connection to yourself and to understand where all your thoughts and your patterns and your beliefs are coming from and why your tendencies are what they are. The idea of like confession or like confessing your sins to be absolved is very different than the process of going through say an ayahuasca ceremony because you're not, it's not like you're showing up in a confession booth and you're saying, you know, forgive me father, I've sinned and you know, like I've con you know, committed adultery or something like that, right? It's, it's not that, it's you really create a, a line of communication to what I would consider to be like source energy. You know, you could call it God or universe or something like that. But when you open yourself up to this medicine, there's a, there's a spiritual nature to it and a connection to yourself and to something greater that you, you, really, you really feel, like you feel, you feel fully. It's not logically like I have faith, it's an inner knowing. And that inner knowing that comes with these ceremonies and especially being surrounded by other people who are all going through their own transformational journeys. You know, you hear people, you know, crying. Some people are purging, you know, throwing up and, and you get this collective sense of a release of trauma. It is a literal release of trauma. A lot of people are afraid of going into an ayahuasca ceremony thinking, oh, I don't want to throw up. I don't want to purge. The purge is beautiful and it doesn't happen to everybody. Um, a lot of people don't purge or they purge in different ways like laughing or dancing or yawning, but a lot of people do vomit. Um, and that purge is essentially the medicine in your body releasing energy that doesn't serve you anymore, like releasing that negative energy. And when it's out of you, you feel, I mean, you feel so much better. You feel lighter. You feel like you've actually, you haven't just removed like whatever you're puking up, whatever food you ate earlier you're releasing energy that doesn't serve you anymore. It doesn't take you confessing your sins to do that. It, face, it takes you, and in, in combination with the medicine and the ceremony and the experience, um, reconciling with yourself what you're carrying and why you're carrying it, and then releasing it and choosing to release it. And then on the other side of that, feeling deeply what it feels like to be without those that negativity that you're, you've been carrying for who knows how long. If this has piqued your interest in any way, like find out more information, connect with us, because it's so important if you hear this message and it resonates with you in any way to just, to just take a look, take a deeper look and see if this could be right for you. You can find us at sacredsoldier.com. 
that has all the information about our retreats. You can also find out more information about psychedelics in general um, through our company, Psychex, P-S-Y-C-H-E-X.com. And you can find us on Instagram. We're, we're, we're very active on Instagram at, uh, at Sacred Soldier Retreats or at Join Psychex. And on those channels, we, we put out a lot of information about our retreats that are coming up, about the benefits of psychedelic medicine and community to healing from trauma, and especially for, for veterans and PTSD and mental illness. And on our PsychX platform, we also talk a lot more about, uh, about psychedelics in general, Psych like information and knowledge to know about psychedelics, about psychedelic legislation, about the medicine itself. So we're just constantly trying to educate, inform, and destigmatize while also through our Sacred Soldier retreats, provide the opportunity to actually come to us and, and experience the medicine yourself fully legally. We operate, we operate with a ayahuasca church who um, conducts all of their, their work, their ayahuasca work completely above board. So we do our retreats in Las Vegas, Nevada, and um, they, are, they are an incredible experience that will create significant transformation in your life. And I look forward to welcoming anybody that wants to experience it into our doors and, and working with us. We'd love to have you. I just encourage everybody to take their healing journey seriously and know that you know, putting that oxygen mask on first, really taking care of yourself, really healing you know, the deep wounds that a lot of us carry frees you to live such a higher quality of life, live in gratitude, live in joy and bliss and connection with other people. And it's important, it's important to take that first step and to start to heal yourself because on the other side of that healing is, is, is a life that you can't even imagine where we've shed the negativity that we carry and we move on with a lot more weightlessness, feeling, feeling truly free to live our best lives. And that is absolutely what I want for everybody, especially our, our veteran brethren to be able to experience.